Our next panel will be addressing disrupting yesterday's disruptors, paving the way for millennials. Please welcome Alexia Sotsis, um, Nathan Blacharzik from Airbnb, Task Rabbit's Leah Busk, Brit.co's Britt Marin, and Lyft's John Zimmer. One too many chairs. We can move over. No, it's no, no. Surprise it's guest. All right. Guest. Should we move down? Yeah, let's move down. I'm gonna take this chair. All right. This is amazing touristy talk. Everyone in this room can be an entrepreneur. Uh, everyone on the stage is an entrepreneur. Um, you guys have disrupted incumbents in your industry. Uh, some of you are, have disrupted the disruptors of incumbents in your industry, like John. Um, what do you guys think motivates an entrepreneur to destroy things and, <laughs> and build other things? I think for me, it was all about hitting a pain point in my life, in real life, and then just deciding that it was unacceptable that it was there, and just finding a way to innovate something better to, to fix that problem. I think it's the challenge. Uh, starting a business is certainly a challenge, and delivering uh, higher quality products is a challenge, but to basically change the rules of the game, which is what disruption does, is I think the ultimate challenge. Yep. For me, it, it was matching my own personal passion with this massive gap in the market that I knew I could fill, and I felt like it was my life's will to fulfill. <laughs> And for me, it's just seeing the world as a better place and wanting to do anything possible to, to push things in that direction. Did you initially start out to challenge an industry? Did you want to destroy, did you want to make transportation young, for lack of a better term? For, for, for us at, at Lyft and Zimride, we saw that 80% of seats were empty on our highways. We saw that uh, the second highest household expense was transportation. And so, uh, yeah, you know, we set out to change that. We set out to make transportation more affordable and more social. Leah, did you think that you would un upend a certain section of Craigslist? No, not at first, I'll be honest. I, um, you know, the idea came out of uh, needing dog food one night for my 100 pound yellow lab named Kobe. And uh, I was still at IBM at the time. and quit IBM, built the first version of the site, and just knew that this was a product that I wanted to use, and I know a lot of other people wanted to use it too. And it just kind of snowballed from there. And then I think timing, uh, particularly with the economic downturn, really um, cultivated a, a piece of the market that we just saw that we could fulfill and tackle. I'd say the same for Airbnb. Uh, in the beginning, we were originally overflow housing for events and conferences. Um, and it wasn't until at least probably a year later that we fully realized uh, the potential to, uh, to, to disrupt that why don't we make it just as easy to book someone's home as it is a hotel and the power of that idea. Uh, maybe I'm the only one <laughs> who can say yes, but I mean, to me, Martha Stewart had been my sort of inspiration growing up, and the older I got, the more out of touch I felt with her. And it wasn't just my generation and the millennials, it was women that were in their 40s were also feeling out of touch with her. And, and there really was no other person that existed in that category. So to me, yes, I, I kind of knew what I, was, what I was coming into the market to do. I mean, what's interesting is that, like your story with dog food uh, and Kobe, is that these things came out of your personal lives. Like you thought, what Jack said about bringing the future faster, didn't you, weren't you looking at wedding websites and you thought, wow, all of these are, are sort of terrible? Yeah, I, I, was getting, I was getting married and everything in the wedding market exists, uh, that existed at the time was quite appalling. Uh, there was nothing that was social, nothing that was really great on mobile, um, and the design of all of the different wedding sites uh, were pretty, pretty low quality as well. And 
And I get it if engineers don't really want to work in the wedding industry, but it's an $80 billion industry, and it's one of the most meaningful moments you'll have in your life. And so uh, it, starting Wedgeware sort of propelled me into everything that I'm doing now, not only because I was designing software, but because I was also putting together my entire wedding by myself in terms of making the decorations, like figuring out the social arrangements and so forth. So, yeah, I, starting the wedding, the wedding business actually propelled me into what I'm doing. I mean, is there, it, other than having um, a lack of a mobile strategy, is there any indicate, is there any universal indicators that an industry is ready to be disrupted? Well, I think you should look at what's working in other verticals and understand, does that translate into what other vertical you're, you're interested in? Uh, certainly with Airbnb, we came up with a basically a new model uh, that's now being referred to as the sharing economy. Uh, and you see that being applied to so many, so many different verticals to, to disrupt. I mean, Leah and uh, John, you both are in this whole collaborative consumption trend. Britt, I, 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 I assume you will be eventually because that's, what, that's where things are headed, right? Like, how would you apply your lifestyle business to... How would I what? How would you apply your lifestyle business to, like, a collaborative consumption thing? I mean, you're the one that stands out of all these three. They're sharing rides, you're sharing... Um, services. Services, and you're sharing... You're sharing accommodations. accommodations. Right. You're sharing rides and you're sharing services. Britt, are you sharing something? We're kind of sharing uh, mm. ideas for your everyday life. And, and on the flip side, we actually are building software that supplements all of those ideas as well. So it's a combination of, of this media and content play and also a software and technology play. So is the indicator that people aren't sharing, that the industry hasn't become collaborative, consumptive? Is it, is it just that they're not good with mobile? Is it that they're not? I think one of the things when I look at TaskRabbit and what we've done compared to, you know, uh, competitors from decades ago, like Angie's List, Service Magic, Craigslist, um, they never really embrace the social aspect, the social graph. And so as soon as Facebook hit and Facebook Connect come out, came out, um, and we all started actually building on Facebook Connect, um, you know, back in 2008, 2009. Those guys never evolved. Um, and so I think looking for industries, companies that haven't embraced those social, mobile, location components yet is definitely a key indicator. How do you maintain um, trust and safety and, and your reputation systems with this speed of innovation? I know all of you have had, uh, except for Britt, <laughs> all of you have had uh, certain challenges and have adapted to them. Yeah, I, I'll speak to that. Uh, now, it's for sure challenging. Uh, we're doing something for the first time, and we're trying to solve uh, problems that haven't been solved before. I think what we've come to realize is uh, the importance of uh, being proactive on these topics. Um, you know, there are some things that we can't control that are outside of our product, um, but the importance of as a company having trust with our users uh, that they know we are putting in systems to protect them, uh, we've seen to be extremely important. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i referring specifically to that, the infamous hotel trashing thing. What, what was your greatest lesson learned there? I mean, I think what we realized is we weren't, hadn't been proactive enough, right? We had basically hadn't, we hadn't innovated on the trust and safety question uh, for the first couple of years. Um, the original model facilitated payments, had reviews, and this was a, a really big first step. But for a couple of years, that, that hadn't really changed. And coming out of, out of that incident, uh, that's when we instituted the, the host guarantee, um, which is now $1 million of coverage uh, in the event that you have any property damage. Uh, and that's when we stepped up our customer support to offer 24-7 uh, support in 20 different languages. So it, it was... We became a stronger company for it, and we also realized uh, that we need to always be pushing ahead. And in terms of our product roadmap now, uh, we have different buckets um, that make up a pyramid, and our foundational layer in the pyramid is trust and safety. We believe above all What are all the other else, buckets? <laughs> uh, on top of that is systems, so the reliability of the website, the performance, et cetera. On top of that is growth, optimization, and then new product um, that further differentiates us is on the top. Yeah, and I, I think on, on trust and safety, we all learned from 
from Airbnb and, and, and what happened. And I think, so we've been live with Lyft for about 11 weeks. Uh, How long did it take you to get a background check on, on the Lyft drivers? Was it something that you implemented? Right away, from right the away? beginning, yeah. It takes 24 hours, but yeah, we, we started doing uh, criminal background checks, DMV record checks, and, and learning from that uh, experience, we wanted to go above and beyond what already existed for alternatives. So today, what we do for uh, drivers on our platform is more than any alternative does uh, you know, for, those, for their drivers. We just instituted the first of its kind million dollar excess liability uh, insurance you know, in week, uh, week 10. What does uh, that entail? So if you get in a car crash in a lift, you're insured for a million dollars of what? So the, the driver's insured for, for liability. Uh, and all the drivers are also required as part of our background check to have uh, personal insurance as well. This is on top of that. Leah? Yeah, with TaskRabbit, when I first launched the company back in Boston in 2008, I launched it with um, this small mother's organization, and from day one, they were asking me about trust and safety. So that was something that I definitely had to proactively think about um, from the beginning. So over the course of the last four years, um, we've created a pretty rigorous vetting process that includes some background checking, um, but also a, a really robust reputation engine, ratings, reviews, badges, points, uh, that our task rabbits can earn on the site that's helped a lot as well. I mean, you, the argument of the <coughs> big, more established companies against this sort of innovation is that, for example, you know, Uber or taxi drivers are professional drivers. Um, you know, temp agencies, are prof they, they're professionals, they've got these systems in place, they've been around for, for tens of years. Um, are there specific moments that, that you guys have had where you, like what's the worst thing that has happened on TaskRabbit? Are there specific moments where you're like, oh wow, we, we really do have to be really careful, or we really do have to, to, to compete with the big guys, we really do need to make it almost professional level? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're describing there is that level of quality um, that comes along with trust and reputation and, and safety as well. And, you know, when I look at what Angie's List, Craigslist, Service Magic has done, consumers deserve more. They deserve better. It's the temp agency market is such an old world model that no one has innovated on in decades. Um, and so, you know, I think with TaskRabbit, what we're looking to do is bring those old models of work into a new age and a new way of doing things. I think critics will always pose these what if questions and try to shoot bullets into, into what you're doing and, and use that, paint it as black and white, saying that, oh, well, what if this happens, therefore you shouldn't do this at all. Uh, and that's certainly not a, an entrepreneur's or an innovator's kind of outlook. Um, and I think inevitably, it's, there's shades of gray, and you, the entrepreneur, the innovator, needs to be striving towards, towards that, that idealism, but there are no silver bullets. Um, and even with some of all that we do, there are, it's not a silver bullet. There still are what-if scenarios, especially when operating on a global scale, right? Because background checks, et cetera, the availability of these things vary by country. Um, and so that's not an excuse. Proactive is important, but to say what if this, what if that is also not, not super helpful. Uh, and, I, and I think it's on us to also tell the stories on the flip side as well. It's important that we're doing everything above and beyond for safety and trust. I think it's also important that we're telling the amazing stories of you know, a, a Lyft driver uh, getting lunch for the person that they took to their meeting because the person said they didn't get lunch, or uh, you know, a Lyft ride where the, the, the female passenger had just broke up with her boyfriend uh, and she asked if, if the other female uh, driver could drive around the blocks a few more times and then they hugged at the end of it. Um, these are experiences that aren't happening in our current status quo transportation options. And this is what all of these solutions can, can change. Has anything bad happened on Lyft and it's 11 weeks? Uh... The 11 <laughs> weeks, again, and, and we're doing everything to prevent uh, bad things from happening. The, the worst thing we hear about is uh, maybe the driver not knowing, uh, having the right directions to get there, which we're actually solving through better navigation in the product. And um, speaking about, speaking of the global uh, challenges, scale, 
I opened up Lyft today to come to Disrupt, and there were no drivers. <laughs> and then I opened up Sidecar, and there were no drivers on Sidecar, so I ended up going with Uber. How do you manage scale if you if you've got a product like Lyft or or like a, like Airbnb or or something that just catches on like wildfire and then yeah I think has no available resources. It's it's a it's a unique challenge because again we've been doing this for 11 weeks and the demand has consistently outstripped the supply. Um, we have to race as fast as possible to build you know a, a really solid supply chain uh, onboarding process, but at the same time. With that speed, I think you also have to be, there's responsibility to keep and maintain the same quality so that uh, the community and the experiences you've had uh, in Lyft uh, remain as we grow. A analytics are super important. So we're measuring supply and demand and other quality metrics by market and projecting these out to see how they're trending uh, to try to stay ahead of, of these imbalances that can happen. To John, your point, it can be really tempting just to go really broad, really wide scale, really fast, but diminish that quality aspect. Um, and so I think you know every entrepreneur has to make a choice about what's important to them as part of their marketplace, as part of their platform. So do you see yourselves competing against either, do you see yourselves competing more against the incumbents, like more against the Transportation Administration, more against Martha Stewart, or the other startups in your space, like Exec in, in relationship to TaskRabbit, or all of the, um, all the Airbnb, like Wimdu in China for Airbnb. Do you see yourselves more competitive against the big guys or the people trying to, to eat your lunch? I think, um, I don't worry about the big guys, number one. Um, I think that can't get complacent with where you are in the industry. So with TaskRabbit, we've always had this first mover advantage of creating this service marketplace for people to connect to exchange services. And now we're starting to see competitors pop up, but I still realize that our visions are very different. I mean, TaskRabbit is looking to revolutionize the labor force on a global scale. I don't know of any other competitors looking to do that. Um, and so you just really have to stay focused on what you're building, drive towards your vision, um, and I think that's how you're going to get the best results. What do you think about exec? I think that from the end user perspective, exec and TaskRabbit have very similar experiences. Like you could go to exec or you could go to TaskRabbit if you needed you know, your house cleaned or you needed groceries delivered. Um, but I think the back end component, the supply side, um, that experience is very different, and we have very different visions for what we're building there. I mean, it's, it, com the competition in this space is so vicious. I had an exec uh, come over and clean my house, and they left a chocolate on my pillow, <laughs> which was <laughs> so, uh, and they're trying to compete with professionals, that's why. And so to see something that fast, happen that fast, and to see those kinds of details be taken care of uh, by a startup is kind of, I mean, it's mind blowing, but it's also really inspiring. Are you guys scared more of Wimdu or of? So there's certainly been a lot of Airbnb clones over the years. Uh, we are still the number one leader in every market of the world. Uh, that's partly in thanks to uh, the strong network effects that are inherent in our business. And not just network effects within any given market, but because we're a travel business. We're big in the United States because we're big in Europe. We're big in Europe because we're big in the US. Um, so because we started uh, first and kind of enjoyed a head start, and during this entire process, I think have had the best quality product. Uh, we're at a point now where we don't think about the competition at all. Right, you, you're going up against Martha Stewart, and you don't really have any clones yet. I'm sure, I'm sure they'll come up, it's <laughs> inevitable. Uh, but you're partnering with, with sort of an equivalent brand with uh, Katie Couric and ABC, so, do you feel like you have to kind of, if you can't beat them, join them, or? Necessarily, I mean, the, the one advantage I think I have with the business that I've created is that a personality and a face is behind it, and um, that really helps you navigate through the, the weeds, I guess you could say, to reach your demographic, and Martha is 71 at this point, so I wouldn't say that she necessarily <laughs> relates with the 25-year-olds of the world. Um, I'm 26. And so I am really hitting a sweet spot with the 18 to 35 crowd. 
And, and yes, I don't have any competitors just yet because it's, it's actually pretty hard to do, to put yourself out there to build both a media brand and a technology company. Well, what, okay, what is tech about Brit? Why do you consider yourself a tech company? Uh, so we're building software in addition to the, the, all the media that we are putting out as well. So our first app was Wedgeary. We have another app in the works. We also are working on a commerce initiative as well. And of course, we, we cover a lot of technology, news, and products in addition to that. So for the entrepreneurs out there that are considering starting companies after Jack motivated, motivated them to, what industries are, are the most vulnerable to being disrupted right now? I would think the salon industry. Where, where do you see, what needs to be Britified? What needs to be Airbnbified, Liftified? I think it, if you look at you know, a lot of these companies, it's in the areas, you know, we're in a tough economy, so it's in the areas where people spend uh, the most money. And so the number one household expense is your house, you know, hence Airbnb, and the, the number two household is transportation. You know, the, the other way that people get money in this economy is through, through jobs and task rabbits. So I think in a tough economy, which seems like it's going to be, be that way for a while, I think it's important to think about uh, where are those big financial and economic opportunities. Yeah, I would say two of the, the biggest expenses in your lives are your wedding and your kids. <laughs> and so baby, kids and babies is, is one that I think is really interesting that not a lot of people have gotten into yet. And also pets is another one that, that is pretty interesting. More people have a pet in San Francisco than they have a child. Um, so this market would sense. be a good one yeah. to start with. And figure, and people spend a lot of money on their pets as well. So we're going to go to audience QA. Do we have microphones? All right, so people just can come up to the microphones and ask questions. Anybody? Jordan? Oh, God. All right, I'll just continue asking my questions. <laughs> no one has a question for these entrepreneurs. Wow, guys. I'll add one more thought to okay, the previous question while we we'll probably wait, uh, which is there's still so much business being done offline that hasn't come online yet. Uh, and a lot of that is fragmented. And with mobile being ubiquitous, I think there's a real opportunity to, to use technology to, to bring it online or to uh, connect those two worlds, offline and online. I think two spaces as well that uh, I think all of us have thought a lot about uh, is around the trust and safety, but then also around payments. And I think there's a lot of innovation that needs to happen in both of those uh, spaces that actually all of us would end up using as well. Uh, any specifics? Well, um, so one example, something we're looking into at TaskRabbit, is our TaskRabbits right now, when they go out to uh, purchase your groceries, are floating that expense themselves. But if we had some sort of mobile payment mechanism where we could, as TaskRabbit, float them the money mm. uh, and have it transferred a different way, that would be pretty awesome. Are you listing payment startups? Yeah, build that and then <laughs> build come talk that, to me. <laughs> All right, we've got a question. Uh, hello, I'm Phil from Why Own It. Um, I have one question. You all have disruptive startups. How did you get your first 10,000 users? How did you get your first 10,000 users? One thing that's been really helpful for us in the city is, uh, and this is maybe not what you're looking for, but has been uh, pink mustaches on our cars. Um, and so I think it's really what it was, is it designing the experience so that people would talk about it. So I think Airbnb had a fantastic graphic on uh, word of mouth. Um, and we actually designed that into our experience so that when uh, you see pink cars with pink mustaches around town, you then see people telling others, oh, that's Lyft. Um, and so putting something into your product that uh, fosters word of mouth is really powerful. I mean, why would someone use Lyft versus Uber? For the mustache? For the, for no. the fist bump? <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, I think the two tenants that, that are different, uh, that we're focused on, is affordability uh, and, and then the social community experience. Um, so I think those would be the main reasons. How did you get your first? 10, yeah, I mean, I would say really Good utilizing question. all of the different social APIs like Facebook Open Graph API and thinking about gamification, viral loops, all the things that everyone tells you all the time. But you know, even as a con on a content site, like including Open Graph actions, um, Facebook comments, and different types of social social modules, is really important within Weduary. 
Um, weddings are really social by nature, so when the bride and groom log in and invite all of their guests, that they're inviting 150 new users for every wedding on average. So you can see how things can really grow from there. For us, we uh, just hyper-focused on a geo and then a customer segment. So I mentioned before, we focused on this mother's group in Boston. Uh, and once we had sort of cornered the market with that one mom's group, the moms were talking to the other moms in Beacon Hill and Back Bay and Cambridge, and it just spread from there. For Airbnb, we rode uh, someone else's wave. It was Thank August, uh, no, <laughs> no. It was August 2008, and uh, the Democratic National Convention uh, was happening, which was a catalyst for us in two ways. One, there was an explicit need for additional housing. There are like 80,000 people coming to Denver, only 18,000 hotel rooms. So there's a need for our product. And secondly, there was a lot of press coverage of this uh, event. And so they were covering, saying, historic event, uh, but people have no place to stay. And uh, we fit into that story and got a lot of coverage uh, that actually, within the first week of launch, we were on CNN uh, doing a video interview. And that resulted in people signing up all over the world. Way to go, press. Guess we're useful for something. One more question, and, and then we're okay. off. Hi, uh, Hugh McLeod from uh, Gaping Void. Hi, Hugh. Hi, Alexia. Anyways, uh, you guys are obviously very bright young things, and uh, they are. <laughs> Lights are and, right. And I live in Miami, which is a nice place to be an artist, but uh, it, it isn't Harvard, it isn't Cambridge, it certainly isn't Silicon Valley. And when we interview people, because we, we, you know, we hire, or we're, we're looking creative people all the time to hire young, young people, they've just not had the education. You know, they don't, they, you come to a place like here, you see these really, really insanely bright kids who are just like after it. B but seeing, living in Miami, you kind of go, dudes, how are you going to, I guess my question is how, how how do you find how do you find good people because it bedevils us surprisingly and also how do how do we get the message out to the rest of the United States or the rest of the world that you got to be more like these guys and not like the not like the people on the Jersey Shore if you want to survive as a civilization. <laughs> <laughs> we this is my pet duty to. Uh, <laughs> I think there's a number of questions there. Uh, how, how do you become more like you and not like the Jersey Shore? <laughs> I think, I think Thanks, Hugh. all of us here have a responsibility to uh, inspire those elsewhere who aren't plugged into a community uh, and so haven't, haven't been inspired, haven't heard these stories. One of the things I enjoy most is uh, when I travel to promote the company, uh, a part of that is also just talking about entrepreneurship. Uh, with um, entrepreneurs uh, all over the place. And it's great to see how, how much energy you give to them by taking one hour of your time and telling them about the early days of Airbnb um, or about Silicon Valley or, or whatnot. I mean, e even very simple stories mean a lot uh, to people who are otherwise aren't plugged in. So I think that hopefully translates into ambition and hunger. Um, and that combined with some passion, I think, can take someone a long ways. Yeah, I, I was lucky enough to be a mentor at, for TechCrunch at South by Southwest, and, um, and that was amazing because you can meet entrepreneurs from all around the country. At the same time, I think social media is really enabling entrepreneurs to connect with other entrepreneurs, and I get tweeted at all the time and emailed all the time, and, and there's no barrier to replying, even if it's 140 characters, you know? I think we're incredibly lucky here in, in Silicon Valley that there's uh, so much talent in, in, in one area. I think there's uh, incredibly smart and talented people all over the, the world. Uh, and I think maybe to tie it back to one of your questions, maybe that's another, or that is another area, another industry, education, uh, that, that we should all think about how we can improve and, and disrupt. Leah? Um, well, <laughs> based on the uh, education point, I was just thinking about how I personally have spent a lot of time going back either to my college or my high school or the um, kids program in my old neighborhood in Boston and just spending time um, at the curriculum level with those students. And I think maybe even a focus on entrepreneurship um, in those classes, either throughout high school through college, would inspire a whole other generation of students from 
all over the country to tackle these awesome problems. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Great panel, guys. Thanks.